Hello everybody, welcome back for season two. It's so great to be um to be back with you today. I'm so happy to be here and in honor of this historic time of historic change in the world, I wanted to sing some songs today of hope and healing, but of course I don't actually know any. So you're stuck with the ones I've got, including this one, one of my favorite passive-aggressive breakup songs. Come to Marvito la rose de cross in a fremato di apre de pre le long so per le bien aimé fume Que les flots des grèves nos rêves plus vite que le givre en fleur nos cœurs. À vous, l'on se croyait fidèle, cruel, mais hélas, les plus longs amours sont courts. Et je dis en quittant vos chats. And on that note, I would like to, to welcome your host, Adam Bailey. Hello, everybody, and welcome to This is a Talk Show. And we have a great show for you today. But first, we need to start off with the big news story of the week. The end of a political career. That's right. The resignation of Canada's own Governor General... Julie Payette. Seen here showing how her conditioner allows her to keep her curls while get rid of those nasty tangles. So bouncy. Julie Payette was forced, uh, not forced, but had a conversation with Justin Trudeau on Wednesday, which was a slow news day, asking her to resign uh, because it turned out that she was mean to people in her office staff. Now, Normally after the end of a US election cycle, I do like to go back to some Canadian politics, but this story is bonkers by comparison. Julie Payette was fulfilling the role of governor general. Basically she represented the queen inside Canada. This is a job that is technically a job you cannot be fired from. You fulfill the term that you're there for and you only leave when that term is done for someone else to come and step in. And this woman was asked to resign because she was, you know, Ellen DeGeneres to her, her coworkers and her subordinates. By comparison, the ex-president in the United States, Donald Trump, was impeached twice and yet never left office. And on the same day that we found out that Julie Payette was going to be vacating the role of governor general, we also found out that Donald Trump, who called himself a wartime president due to the COVID crisis, had zero plan to deal with that crisis. The incoming Biden administration discovered on their desks an envelope filled with nothing, zero plan for that crisis. Donald Trump did not want to do his job and yet we could not get him to leave the office. Meanwhile, Julie Payette is fulfilling a role that is basically a figurehead and there's not much job to do. And she left because she was a little bit nastier than the average boss to her subordinates. Pure bonkers by comparison. Speaking of bonkers, let's also talk about Mitch McConnell. Now, you are all aware that there was an attempted coup of the U.S. government on January 6th that failed. But what violence could not do on the streets and in the Capitol, Mitch McConnell seems to be able to do by his sheer existence in the Senate, because this man is refusing to give control of the Senate over to the Democrats as they argue about the filibuster. Uh, 
McConnell essentially filibustering the Democrats' control of the Senate until they agree that they will not take the filibuster off the table. I, ironically, the best argument for scrapping the filibuster that exists. And the issue with the filibuster for all our Canadian friends is that they cannot pass legislation in the US Senate unless they get a super majority, which is filibuster proof, 60 instead of 50 votes. And they wanna get rid of that so the Democrats can do some things with this 50% majority that they have. Now, if they had control over the committees in the Senate, then they could do some powerful things. You see, budget reconciliation allows the current administration to get some work done without having that super majority. They only need to have 50 votes instead of the 60. And budget reconciliation would be under the control of the person in charge of the budget committee, and that person would be Bernie Sanders. Now, if Bernie Sanders gets control of this committee, he's going to do a lot of good for the United States. Some of the things they have on their table would even reduce homelessness as much as up to 75%. But Bernie Sanders is being kept from his role as head of the Budget Oversight Committee by Mitch McConnell. And I guess until then, he'll just have to be satisfied with his new job, replacing Kim Cattrall on sex in the city. My body is not meant for the 1%. My body is meant for the 99%. It's meant for the working class, for the people who need health insurance, for the people who are making minimum wage. This is a democratic socialist body. <clears throat> Did I do a good job at that <laughs> impersonation? Uh, maybe. A little bit more Kim Cattrall than Bernie Sanders, though. Uh, the real big story of this week, of course, was the inauguration of the Americans' 46th president, Joe Biden, and 49th vice president, Kamala Harris, who is the first woman to be vice president in the United States of America, the first black person to have this role, and the first woman of South Asian descent to be vice president of America. It is a huge role, and she was stealing the show. That is, up until the moment that Amanda Goodman got on stage and the youngest poet ever to speak at inauguration completely bowled us all over with his her glorious poem, The Hill We Climb, with lines like, and so we lift our gazes not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first, we must put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. A beautiful and gobsmacking poem. And we're fortunate today because we also have our own poet laureate, um, Lara Ray, who will be speaking with us later in the afternoon. We're also going to be joined this afternoon by Matthew Ardill, a fabulous comedy podcaster. And uh, we're gonna have a great chat with them. But before we move on to that, I'd also like to recognize that this week we lost Larry King, who was the king of, of talk shows. Uh, I remember as a child, he was the one talk show host that would interview the Muppets and treat them as if they were an actual real interview uh, of, of flesh and blood characters, not felt and fur. And occasionally he'd even allow Kermit the Frog to replace him on days that he had to take a sick day or go on vacation. Um, Larry King was a fantastic interviewer and he will be missed. Um, we'll have more to talk about him later as well. But first I'd like to bring back your co-host, and the woman who sings at the top of all of our shows, Kristen Mueller, he slipped. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello. Hello. Happy New How Year. How are you? I am good. How are you? I am. I'm pretty good. I, I mean, it was it was a week. We got to see fireworks. Mm -hmm. uh, the most on the nose presentation of the song Fireworks ever. Uh, mm -hmm. And we got a new president and a lot of things that were filling my head. Uh, suddenly weren't filling my head anymore. I had yep. space for new thoughts. That was exciting. And then on Thursday, I actually had a bit of an emotional crash. And I wanted to ask you, did you experience an emotional crash this week? Did I experience an emotional crash, the crash this week? Well, not like more than usual. I don't know. I mean, actually, I was kind of like, um, you, it felt kind of just like, okay. 
I it's done, but I felt like I was done with it before it was over. If you know what I mean, I was like I'd already been there. And oh, then, you were like the, the person yeah. who gives their two weeks notice at work and then stops doing the job and just sits at their desk yes. twiddling their thumbs. And that was, yes. that was, your I, was I had already mentally left the building and it was like, oh, okay. I was very happy that nothing worse happened. Nothing bad happened. Um, and then I was just like, I didn't even watch it. I just completely, you know, ignored it and pretended it wasn't happening. So. Oh, I mean, it, it was a beautiful inauguration. Um, yeah. They didn't have any, there was no crowd to have, but they, they still managed to have a lot of great things. Uh, Lady Gaga had an insane bird brooch that was like the entire side of her upper quadrant of her body. Like it, mm -hmm. it was a, it, it was a thing to watch. Uh, I believe she created some kind of new interpretation of the American national anthem, which is just how it's going to be from now on. Um, but I haven't looked it up, so. You you need to you need to you need yeah. to go and watch some of these pieces from the inauguration. That the poem yeah. especially was yeah. was gobsmacking and beautiful. Um, so so that was how you responded to to the inauguration. What what do you think is going to happen going forward? Oh, are we in our new segment now? Yes, I think we are. Yeah, let's Adam, bring this up. Let's bring this back from the past. Yeah. Um, Adam and Kristen predict the future. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, we need some theme music for that. Um, well, okay, I, I, you know, okay. I feel like a little cautionary, little little item of caution for our friends in the United States. Um, anyone who lived in Toronto through the Rob Ford era will be familiar with this. What happened after Rob Ford, who got elected? Um, a boring, conservative, middle of the road, stuffed shirt type who did not promise any kind of radical change, right? John Tory was not interested in enacting any kind of radical program. He was a return to the status quo. And no no shade on Biden or anything like that. I'm sure he's just fine, but he is also not, not particularly uh, the radical candidate. So you guys picked the guy who will take you back to the way things were before, which wasn't that great. So it's better, <laughs> but... <laughs> Don't expect too much is what I'm saying. Be prepared pre to be really disappointed. Oh, well, you're predicting like, don't go back to brunch yet, folks. There's still some work to do. Um, yeah. Yeah, because one thing that happened in Toronto with Rob Ford is that there was this huge increase in political engagement because there was something really dramatic and bad happening. So, and then when it just like the old version of bad came back, people stopped caring as much and, you know, and things didn't get as much better, which is why I live in Montreal now. So... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he, Tory, I think, is a terrible mayor, but I think, I think Biden, um, I think there's a bit of a false divide between liberals and progressives in the states because Biden, much like Hillary Clinton, has the most progressive platform of anyone ever to be at that level, run at that level in the United States. But I think rhetorically they're centrist, even though mm -hmm. policy-wise they're they're progressive on a lot of fronts. Yeah, and I think that um, drives some people up the wall. I, I'm. Bernie Sanders being in charge of the budget committee to me is a huge sign that things are not going to be typical centrist, do nothing, continue yeah. the race baiting. And the fact that he also, Biden brought up race and white supremacy in his inauguration speech and talked mm -hmm. about white supremacy as the problem that it is, which no one has done at, on that DS before. And mm -hmm. I was just like, you know, that that for me was a sign that things are going to move in a direction that they might not have moved before. So I'm I'm kind of looking forward to that, I think. Well, cautious optimism is always a nice stance to take up. Um, and you know what? That is actually probably the way to avoid disappointment. If you think this will probably, you know, you, you hope for the best and but not too much. And then, you know, whatever good things that happen, you can celebrate. So that's true. So let's, you know, this is the new year. This isn't that far from New Year's. We can, you know, embrace positivity and all that crap and uh, try to look on the bright side. I think that's a great attitude. Yeah, I think, and I think the other thing yeah. is that we also have to realistically look, like the work that I see happening is that we have to seriously figure out how we undo the radicalization that's happened mm -hmm. through QAnon and white supremacist movements and the white supremacist arm of the evangelical church. And that stuff is going to be um difficult to do especially because I, I see things about q online i see things about nazis online i i see a trickle about um the the white supremacist version of evangelical christianity mm -hmm. and a lot happens through that route it actually i think is why a julie payette 
leaves her job um, knowing that she's disgraced her office, where a Mitch McConnell will act like he's in charge no matter where he is in the house because there is this manifest destiny belief in white supremacist Christianity that America was given to white European Protestant settlers by God as a sign that they were the new chosen people. And so no matter what the constitution says, this is God's new Christian nation on earth. Mm -hmm. And whatever party represents that faith, the Republicans in this state are the actual rightful rulers, no matter what. And when you throw a belief like that onto something toxic like white supremacy, it's a powerful, powerful force. Like I'm oddly really happy that Biden is so openly Catholic because it makes it so much harder for, for the, uh, the other side to claim that they are the actual Christians mm. when Biden's so blatantly going to church. Then again, the, the evangelicals thought that Trump was appointed by God. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and he was the least Christian person I think that might exist in the world. And I think the Ayatollah is more Christian than Donald Trump. So. He probably shares more values. Um, that's true. Um, well, that's a, yeah, point taken. And uh, so how, how should, should we have some kind of de-radicalization segment on the show from now on? How to de-radicalize your neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I could see that, that being a, a fun failed yeah. experiment. That, that, you yeah, know. definitely. Yeah. How, how to get your swastika tattoos removed. Um, <laughs> it's, just, it's just pictures. Once we can safely go down the streets and talk to people, we can do street segments where we try and de-radicalize yeah. people on the streets. And get, instead of punching Nazis, we get punched by Nazis. I, I, I can see that being a... Why would that why would that de-radicalize them? It just makes them feel better so they have like a a more, you know, when they No, do no, we just defend them enough to get punched by them. I know if if this queer yeah. boy was going down the street trying to de-radicalize Nazis, I'd probably take a couple punches. Um yeah. badges of honors. I I try and swing back, but I don't know how to I don't know how to hurt anyone. Um I hope I hope people who want to mug me aren't watching this show. I have no idea how to defend myself. Um uh, Instead of mugging Adam, how about this? Send Adam, send us some money so Adam can buy one of those like novelty punching arms that you wind up so he can punch Nazis with it and not get hurt. Coffee.com slash this is a talk show. Fantastic. Yes. Give us your money. Give yeah. us your money. Uh, and, and with your money, that allows us to stay yeah. on the air and have great interviews with guests, such as mm -hmm. our following guest, Matthew Ardill, who um, is a fantastic uh, podcast host. Um, I've been on several of his podcasts, including the Comedy Album Book Club. Um, welcome to your screens, everybody. Matthew Ardell. Hey, Adam. How you doing? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm. I'm. You know, I'm still recovering from the the inauguration and uh, the loveliness of that poem and and Garth Brooks is. Uh, stirring rendition of uh, uh at the at the end decided to wear jeans because of course he did you know when, when i'm going to an inauguration that's what i wear it's a line in one of his songs matthew in friends in low clay places he talks about wearing jeans to your black tie affair yeah. and then he does it in real life come on but couldn't, he, it, couldn't he have just you know folk like focus a little that you know uh chris Gaines energy in there you know a little like goatee like or you know soul patch and the, the eyeliner you know at least go like if you're gonna go in the wrong kinds of clothes go all the way i don't know i think biden was trying to show representation of all america throughout the day and i think the the, the slice of life that that garth brooks represents wearing jeans at the inauguration was was a needed and appropriate slice of garth it's brooks. true it, it's it's yeah yeah it's true it's true now, now, of course, we're not here just to talk about that. We are here to talk about you and your career. So yeah. you're you're doing a ton of podcasts all over the place. Um, why don't you tell yeah. us about some of them? Sure, sure. Um, right now, I've got two sort of active projects that I'm, I'm really working on. One is uh, Tracy Hamilton, who is a Toronto comedian, um, had a show at Comedy Bar back when you could go to places uh, called Love is Everywhere. And it was a combination of cognitive behavioral therapy and stand-up. And uh, so the premise is she would give a comedian um, homework, cognitive behavioral therapy homework. They'd come in, they do the comedian would do a set, and then she would speak with the comedian about their homework. And uh, a little over, you know, a year and a bit ago, uh, well, more than that, about a year and a half ago now, uh, you know, we chatted about it, and uh, I started helping her 
uh, prepare that. So it's more long form where it's about an hour, an hour and a half. And it's been a great, that's been honestly one of the most rewarding projects that I've been able to work on because it's like mental health and comedy. And it sort of shows, you know, there's a lot of ways to live your life. And it's like I've done wonders for my mental health <laughs> being able to sit in and listen to these conversations. That's amazing. I, I really, I really like that. And I mean, a lot of comedy has been really tackling mental health issues recently. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, so, so I'm, yes, so I'm yeah, yeah. So I highly recommend that. And the other project that I'm, is being on hiatus, I'm bringing it back actually. And by March, I hope to air the new episode, uh, comedy album book club, which you've appeared on. Um, it, traditionally up until now, it's largely been panel shows where we'd listen to albums. Uh, like we've done some great albums. Um, I mean, G we did Jesus is Magic uh, a while back. Uh, that, that was one that I think, I believe you were on that episode. Um, I don't think I was on Jesus is Magic. You had me on Eddie Izzard. I oh, love oh, right. Jesus is Magic yeah, right. though. That's a, that's a yeah. fantastic, fantastic. Terrific um, album. Yeah, and, uh, you know, and it, so we've done a bunch of albums, uh, like some of my favorites. In fact, your next guest, Lara, was on our uh, our episode where we did Lenny Bruce's The Carnegie Hall album, which is like, for me, it's like there's maybe three albums that I really am, are my core albums. I'm really glad we got to talk about. That's one of them because that's, you feel that's kind of like the hub of modern standup is, comes from Lenny Bruce. Like that's the launching off point where that, the format seemed to, to really take form in what we've got. Um, and it's just such a, like there's bits in there that still work to this day. And there's other bits that don't, but there's bits in there like the, the uh, Jesus showing up at a at a church in in New York at St. Patrick's Cathedral, and uh, it just not going down well. Like him and Moses in the back, and they're like frantically calling the Vatican. Uh, so th there's that one, which is really great. Um, we did Richard Pryor's Live on the Sunset Strip, which is another seminal album that I really feel everybody should listen to because it's like a person at their lowest point just reinventing themselves. And he's still at the top of his game, but he's personally at his lowest point. And it shows how you can take tragedy and turn it into comedy. And uh, wow. it's just truly astounding. Um, but yeah, and and uh, the first, it's actually our first episode, um, which is an evening with uh, Mike Nichols and Elaine May, who you know went on to astounding careers in film, uh, you know, directors, writers, but you know the earliest work being in the party circuit in New York, doing like stand up at parties, like that one scene in the Magnificent Mrs. Maisel. Maisel yeah. yeah, that's very much how they got their their start. And and this is like and, and again that is actually I think like its first wave comedy album was like 1961 or 60 that it came out. So it's in the same era as the Button Down Mind of Bob Newhart and that first wave of the modern comedy album. But there's bits in there that timeless completely work today i'm you know i'm, I'm going to be rewatching this this episode to go through all those classic albums that you mentioned because you you are such a great comedy historian and you know you know your comedy so well and and, and what influences whom and where they come from and why they're there it's so it's so awesome getting to talk to you about comedy <laughs> i people want to listen to these podcasts uh about these fantastic albums i know that you also suggest that they listen to the albums first uh, where where can they find this? Uh, comedyalbumbookclub.com. Yeah. Comedyalbumbookclub.com. But is it also on Stitcher? Is it on? Oh, it's on, on Stitcher. On, it's on YouTube. It's on er er everything. It's on yeah. Um, you know, I I the iPhone podcasts, uh, Stitcher, uh, Podbean, anywhere you're, where podcasts can be found, you can you can check these out. Fantastic. And, and I recommend that you do. I'm, I'm on a couple of them. Maybe I am on the Jesus is Magic one. Now I can't remember if I was on that one because <laughs> I think I was on two. You were uh, on two and we did an interview. We didn't. We, so you're on three episodes. We also did a one on one interview. Funny. <laughs> Not today, but sometimes I'm funny. Um, <laughs> funny. Now, now that's fantastic. We do have another guest coming up. You already mentioned her name, Lara Ray. I'm very excited to get to her because it's a week that's all about poetry and that's one of the big things that she does. She's gonna read some poems for us. But before we break to her, I'd like to know, um, are you willing to stick around and do this is a new segment with us? I would love to. I'm looking forward to it. 
Fantastic. So hang in there, Matthew Ardell. Uh, we are going to have you back for This is a News segment. But before we do that, we are going to hear some poetry by the fabulous, the one and only, Lara Ray. Hello. Am I being heard? Yes. Yes. Okay, awesome. Good afternoon, everybody. And I'm so delighted to be doing this today as, um, and I wanna talk when we get to the new segment about the inaugural poem and the history of that um, honor and uh, just how it's changed over time. But I would love to share some poems, uh, some older ones and some newer ones. And so the first set I wanted to do was from a collection called Rednecks of Antarctica. And I grew up in uh, Toronto and Scotland. And so this one is from my time in Toronto uh, when I lived at King and Dufferin. And it is called King and Dufferin. I live at King and Dufferin and I take the Dufferin bus I would take the king's streetcar, but it's a myth. You have more chance of seeing a dragon. I saw a dragon once. I would have gladly vaulted onto his scaly back and valiantly charged downtown, but he told me he was turning at Bathurst. And here's a poem that's a childhood remembrance and it's called Toy soldiers. When I was a child, they had these toy soldiers you got in cereal boxes. They came ten to a set. I had nine. The Roman centurion was impossible to get. Clever marketing. My friend Brian had the soldier. I always hated him for it. One day, when I was playing at his house, I stole it. He never knew I took it. I carried that soldier around with me in my pocket for all those years just to remember. I saw Brian a couple of years ago. He's a lawyer now. Funny. We had a couple of drinks and the topic turned to that cereal box and those toy soldiers and that Roman centurion. Do you know he had kept that incomplete set in his basement for all those years? Now's your chance, I thought. So when Brian went to get the soldiers, I stole his Rolex. And this final poem I'd like to do is from a collection of um, blank verse pieces that are uh, bound together as a uh, two person play called uh, Dragonfly, which was produced two years ago in, uh, by Theater Projects Manitoba as a commission and has been um, published by Sirocco Drama. Uh, out of Toronto is available in, in fine bookshops online and in person and uh, just um, is currently being sold for international sales. So I'm very excited about that. And this is the final piece uh, in that play. And um, it involves me going to see a psychiatrist um, to hopefully get a diagnosis of gender dysphoria, which then will trigger uh, my ability to get funding and gender uh, reassignment surgery, which I did get four years ago in December. Uh, they called me just before Christmas to let me know I had got that. So yes, vagina, there is a Santa Claus. There are a couple of questions more, Lara, said the psychologist. And I know you have been very forthcoming and expressed yourself well, but I need these affirmations for my report. And I know at your age, this must all seem... So forgive me, but I must. Now, you know that you will get this gender confirmation surgery, and it is quite something what they can do, but I need you to state for the report and out loud that you understand that after this surgery, you cannot have a baby. I'm sorry for doing this, but I need you to say, and I say, I do understand. And she smiles until I add, because I am 52, so getting pregnant is not very likely. And during her long frown, I quickly add, and I will not be given a uterus, which makes her smile and continue. And do you understand, Lara, she says, looking down at her paper, that they will be removing during this procedure 
some parts of your body that you have had for a very long time. And in the, she adds like a flight attendant, unlikely event that you grow to regret this decision that these parts cannot be put back on, reattached. And I say, yes, and she smiles. But I add, well, technically they could, but the function would not be so, and she frowns. And I add, to restore harmony, yes, yes, I understand. Well, then, she says, that is that. Thank you. Wow, and thank you, Lara. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for joining us this week. I, I hope that you're doing well in, in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, I am. And I'm. Uh, one thing I regret is I was actually scrambling uh, during Matthew's segment to uh, see if I could find the copy of that earlier collection called Rednecks Antarctica, because I knew I had one in my office, because I wanted to show everyone, because on the cover, it has one of those medieval beak doctors, you know, with the black, almost steampunky and the little beak. And, and yeah, the black doctors. They, they would put the... Um, uh, odor things in like like flowers, a little poultice, so that the smell of uh, decay would not uh, overwhelm them. That was the reason they had this little kind of beaky mask, right? And then the yeah. goggles, of course, were to to protect their eyes. But I I wondered because I thought it was somewhat ironic that I had chosen this figure, you know, from uh, during you know a pandemic. And then I realized, of course, that the reason I chosen 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 it was because we were in the middle of a worldwide pandemic back then in Toronto which was the okay. AIDS, um, the AIDS pandemic. And so- I do get upset sometimes when people say that this is the first pandemic in a hundred years as, as a, a queer person who grew up uh, a teenage boy during, during the AIDS crisis, being told by health teachers that I was going to die in grade nine, like being like, oh. how, like I don't get the, I don't get to be part of the age generation, but also people don't understand that if you were in the shadow of that, there was still a giant impact. Oh, it was a and tremendous, it was a tremendous impact, of course. And this is when we heard noun phrases we'd never heard before, like, um, and, and activities like coffin shopping, you know, when people would talk about going coffin shopping with their lovers, you know, yeah. and that beautiful scene, of course, in a normal heart where he um, basically takes, uh, takes the names out of the Rolodex but he, as they die, but he doesn't want to throw them away. So he bundles them in his drawer. And then as the play and the film progress, eventually he opens up his drawer and it's just a pile wrapped in rubber bands. And then the roll of decks is practically empty with two or three floppy little cards left. And it's such a profound metaphor for, for the loss, you know, including to, I would say to, at, at this present time, the loss of memory as to what that what that epidemic did to us. And then the profound irony, of course, of the fact that um, I, I work in a facility where upstairs there is a, a condominium complex, assisted living for people with long-term HIV uh, survivors. And I can't tell you, and this might not surprise you, um, the amount of conspiracy theories that, uh, that are there and how many of them don't wear masks, although they are extremely vulnerable. And uh, it's a topic for another day, but there are there are reasons for this, right? That um, that come into play psychologically. But uh, that's for another day. But it's just an interesting little kind of kind of note there. I almost wanted to do the opening monologue on trauma and long term trauma and what it means to come out of long term trauma and how retriggering and how and what resilience is and how not everyone has it. Uh, mm -hmm. But I was like, do I want to do a five minute lesson plan or do I want to tell at least one or two jokes? Um, I went with it telling half a joke um, and somewhat of a lesson plan. And, and, and no, I, I, yeah, I understand why that happens. It's just so unfortunate that some people who are very vulnerable and we see this in other minority communities where we're, the system has worked against them in the past. It's hard for them to believe in it now, even well, though they're- works. All conspiracy theories work like this. It, it is a way and it can be, I think, both um, protective, but also uh, in the sense of QAnon narcissistic, which is that it is a function of taking the power back, right? It is yeah. when you have a complete loss of control and the complete loss of status and esteem within a society, whether by your own uh, mediocrity you know, in the case of many of these conspiracy theorists, their, their lives have not gone as they planned. Or in the case of people who are surviving 
uh, diseases through no fault of their own, through through ostracization and and uh, diminishment and loneliness and so on. That one way to take the power back, of course, is to uh, presume to have special knowledge and a status within a community whereby everyone else is a fool, and you are uh, you are a great intellect. And that's one of the functions of this from a, from a psychological and intellectual standpoint that is uh, profoundly interesting. I'm very interested in this topic of uh, conspiracy theories and how they, they infect people and how they differ from other uh, passions and uh, uh, I would say uh, uh, obsessions, you know, including religious uh, obsession. I, I do think they have different characteristics and, and uh, they're not exactly the same and much of what we talk about these days is talked about in such a superficial level. You know, I was fascinated by that show you were talking about with the cognitive behavior and, and, and stuff, because I, I do think that this uh, stand-up world is uh, is a world where we think and talk a great deal about how people behave. And uh, we yeah. really do analyze and study it. And I, I would say as a group, um, not not across the board, but as a group outside of our own different identities, we, we are an outsider community. And it's why our stand-up community, sadly, I think some to some degree is prone to a lot of uh, conspiracy uh, theories. And, um, you know, I've, I've had to go as far as as blocking some people who, who I have uh, affection for. Um, but I just I found it tedious and tiring and obnoxious how um, how off the off the wall they were on, on some of the things that were going on in the world uh, that, that just made no sense what they were saying. And I had eventually uh, consider some of it to be dangerous, you know. Well, we're never going to block you, Lara. Uh, Thank you. You're fantastic to know, and you are fantastic. I, I feel so privileged having you on the show today. Um, but since we have you here, um, it's time for us to do our new segment, the thing that we like to call "This is a new segment." So, are you willing to do uh, a news round rundown with the, with the Kristen, Matthew, and I? More than happy. More than happy. And Kristen, let me say, I did not know that you had such a, an extraordinary as an opera fan. I did not know you had such a beautiful soprano voice. Oh, thank you, Lara. Well, <laughs> now, does that um... fall into does that fall into the mezzo range or are you uh are you a, a full soprano oh no. i'm a soprano for sure i think mezzo's right. often do sing that song that i did um yeah. one of my projects for this show which i haven't done very much is to demystify classical music because um a lot of it gets this aura of refinement when it's just the same um petty bullshit that all other music is about so um, um yeah so i mean yeah, yeah we'll bring me on another day and we can excellent oh right. man i got so many i had a whole thing i wanted to do on valentine's day about how um so many songs are just explicitly about sex but anyway before I have, so many good, I have so many good classical music jokes you know that i've oh, good. I've that from over the years my favorite quote of course is from um from mark twain who says that uh wagner's music is better than it sounds <laughs> <laughs> No argument there. Well, before we get started with the news, I have one small thing to plug. Speaking of podcasts, this is a new podcast I'm doing with some friends called The Middle-Aged Candy Store. It's a surreal comedic podcast of stuff, little short bits of poetry, fiction, sketches from a, that, are, that are pretty weird. Um, and it's pretty much everywhere you can find a podcast except for Spotify because I haven't figured out how to put it on there yet. So check it out. And now we are ready for... This is a news segment. Now, before we start, I like to tell, always start um, by reminding everyone that as extremely serious journalists, me and Adam have carefully selected the most important and most vital news stories for you to know about today. Um, so this is, as they say, all the news that's fit to print. And uh, we take our mission to educate and enlighten the public very, very seriously for a YouTube channel with 35 subscribers. So let's get and on. The to only that. News, uh, I believe it's the only news organization in the world. And yes, so, that's correct right. Correct me if I'm <laughs> wrong. That yeah. has as its logo a uh, peacock with spermazoa as a, as a, <laughs> as, as a tail. I worked extremely hard on this logo. It took me five minutes, so I will not have it impugned. <laughs> to begin with, our first story. Impersonating a property owner, a man paid an artist to paint a cookie monster mural in Peoria. The town and the internet have questions. So um, a mural artist was approached by a man claiming to own this building who had him put on a communist themed cookie monster mural. Um, the caption reads, I believe, peace, land, cookies. Um, the actual owner of the building um, did not request this mural and was pretty upset about it. Um, so <laughs> over to you, panel. <laughs> 
Matthew, I, 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 we haven't heard you in a bit. Let, let's have you take this first. What are your <laughs> impressions of this story? Well, I mean, if somebody did that to my house, the first thing I do is say thank you. I mean, communist themed cookie monster is that's like a, a manna from heaven. Uh, yeah, like it, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm genuinely gobsmacked. <laughs> like that is insane. I'm sure, like he paid, he paid the artist, right, Kristen? Like there was yes. money given to the artist. Yeah, that, that's that's. Yeah. Uh, although I would, I would, I would have pegged Cookie Monster as being a bit of an authoritarian or an oligarch because he wants all of the cookies. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's yeah, true. Eric, do you have any thoughts on on communist Cookie Monster? Of course, yeah. I mean, it brings up so much, and I mean, this is one of my. I mean, every time you bring up a topic, I'm going to tell you it's one that I'm fascinated with. But obviously, uh, one of the ones I'm fascinated with is. Uh, uh, Soviet era propaganda uh, art of which this parodies uh, in, in, in many ways. Uh, but it also, you know, it speaks to the idea of what exactly it is uh, that the person was objecting to, right? And, um, you know, so from a taste standpoint, obviously it's an accomplished piece of, of art, right? It, 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 it takes as its form parodies a very specific genre in a way that has a funny juxtaposition. You know, you could talk about it in in a in a in a class. You know about it from about you know semiology. You could say, you know that the um, that the the Cyrillic alphabet because it is not uh, one that we would uh, able to read. I mean, I knew the first word was peace because I know what mir looks like in in the Russian alphabet. Uh, but beyond that, you know, I'll take everyone's word for it. But <laughs> um, it is sinister. Um, you see that the owner. Uh, the owner's objection uh, doesn't actually seem to be uh, maybe um, I'm just speculating the art itself, but what in his mind it represents, right? Which is communism and so on. But if you look at what is actually said, which is peace, land and cookies, who, who could fucking object, right? And so it's, it's, it's very interesting, you know, and I think it's part of the general conversation about what's going on in America right now is a superficial rejection of things based on uh, rather uh, simplistic and often uh, because the internet pictographic or uh, very uh, simplistic propaganda images that really don't express what the intention of the, the maker is and that a lot of the problems that we have in this world are because people don't have uh, time, time uh, timely in the sense of overtime um, conversations about things. You know where Here, you have it, folks. Go to Lara's house and paint a communist cookie monster on the outside. I'll take she it. Is right. It reminds me of you, uh, you remember when property. What is property? Like that. That is that is Facts. the thing. Is the right. <laughs> <laughs> property yeah. stuff. So paint cookie monster wherever you yeah. want. And All then right. you could, yeah, you can have arguments about private property, but but again, then those of course become ironic, right? When you paint a communist mural, right? You're you're by declaration saying uh, all property belongs to the state. Speaking of property, here's a case of um, a property uh, mistaken in identity. Um, Canadian crooks apologize after realizing they broke into the wrong home, uh, according to the police. So apparently, I've forgotten where this happened now. I'm somewhere in Canada. I think in the maritime somewhere. I might be remembering that wrong. It was a while ago I read this story. Anyway, some uh, tough guys broke into a house um, searching for someone who owed them money. They threatened uh, the women who were there. Um, and upon realizing they really were in the wrong house, they apologized profusely. I believe fixed the door and left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the first thing I would say is that they're miles ahead of the fucking police who bust yeah. into people's houses, uh, wrong houses all the fucking time. Yeah. And never apologize and never fix anyone's fucking door. And so good, good for the crooks. You know, <laughs> the other exactly. is. Yeah, go ahead, Matthew. Sorry. Oh, uh, I just say, you know, like. Like you said, it seems like they're just roaming handymen, you know, just and they're, they're, they're collecting some debts. They're fixing doors. Hey, that's the most Canadian crime too. like, just like just Canadian way of handling a crime. Like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Oh, let me take care of that. You know, like, like clean up afterwards. Like if, if it was like in England or, or, or I could see it like, you know, I, it'd be it'd be completely different or the U.S. It'd be just, just that's just so Canadian. The, yeah. the politeness does, of cleaning up after yourself. It does remind me of years ago um, in the, in New York in the 1980s. There were two very unfortunate young African American men who decided to do a, a late night uh, stick up of an Italian restaurant that was very um, 
very, very connected to and owned by um, one of the uh, one of the crime families that operated uh, in the area, and that within 24 hours, uh, the money had been uh, returned with some uh, some gifts and a, and, and a rather long and lengthy letter of an apology from the, the, the a written apology. <laughs> When you yeah. know, the dawn, you the subtext, yeah, the subtext of <laughs> yeah. which don't don't kill me, don't kill yeah. me. It's just, it well, was an accident. I'm, it was I don't an like accident. writing thank you notes. I hate thank you <laughs> notes. Like there's no way I'm ever sending a written apology for any crime I commit. Just you know, so I'll, I'll be careful never to ta target a mob boss. Uh, moving on, we've got a new science segment today: news from space. So there's Whee! three stories to discuss. First of all. Scientists grew tiny human brains and hooked them up to robots. So this is exactly, oh, and then they send them to space. This is exactly what happened. This is an experiment where I believe the robots were spider shaped. They um, took yep. some human brain cells, cultured them, grew them, put them into little tiny spider robots and sent them to space. What could possibly go wrong? Crashed Israeli lunar lander spilled tardigrades on the moon. They don't know if any of them survived, but um, they, uh, they left some tardigrades there. I'm not sure what they were doing there or why they were there in the first place, but there are now some tardigrades on the moon. Again, what could possibly go wrong? And last of all, a raging debate on Reddit was turned into an article. Could a single speeding Cheeto destroy the International Space Station? A bunch of people pretending to be aeronautical engineers weighed in on this one. Some say yes, some say no. Thoughts from our panel on I'm, robot I'm, robots and brain robot brains tardigrades on the moon and Cheeto versus ISS. The Cheeto is 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 a Trump troll waiting for a, a joke and a punchline. Um, the the one that makes me curious is the tardigrades because they they can live theoretically in outer space and in really harsh conditions. So. So there's actually like life on, on the moon now. I would like to hear um, someone's thoughts on that one. Um, Lara, do you have any thoughts on tardigrades? Um, yes, I do. Now that you explained to me what they were, um, because <laughs> one, one, of my, one of my interests is not uh, science. And um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting both. Uh, I mean, uh, they all fall under the idea, I would say, of, uh, you know, Pandora's box, right? If you think about it, right? You know, a Cheeto is a bad place. To, uh, you know, you don't want to find a Cheeto in Pandora's box, uh, number one. <laughs> you know, number two is that, um, you know, the idea of tardigrades or the idea of foreign life um, being, you know, it, it, first of all, it breaks the prime directive very, very, very uh, emphatically. And so it's bad from Federation policy, obviously. Uh, the other, of course, is that um, all of them, yes, uh, have the idea of us mucking with things that are beyond our control, which uh, going back to the Greeks and early civilizations was was considered to be a cautionary tale. Um, uh, the Cheeto one seems unlikely unless it was to get into the space station and somebody was to eat it, in which case they would probably develop colorectal cancer within 15 years by eating <laughs> garbage that uh, we pretend is food. And then the other one, of course, is Ray Kurzweil and uh, Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk to some degree and uh, almost everybody that is interested, uh, Isaac Asimov in advanced technology as it uh, applies to uh, artificial intelligence says exactly the same thing. Stop building intelligent robots because it will get to the point where after the singularity they will all come and they will hammer us to death and take over the planet. No, and that's, no. that's always what I picture when I see that is things coming into areas and just picking things up and throwing them because they find them disagreeable. I always think of robots uh, once they take over the planet as behaving like two-year-olds if they were to take <laughs> I don't think just, that's what's going to happen. I think you put a human brain into a giant spider robot and they get a starring role in a Wild Wild West remake. Like that, <laughs> is, that is where I see that going. But Matthew, you you um, know a lot about science fiction and this stuff. So I want to hear your thoughts. I have to wonder if just NASA is sitting around going like, how do we make Star Trek happen? Because I mean, you've got, you've got V'ger brains being shot into space from Star Trek the motion picture basically so this is like those spider bots are going to come back and like like just out for revenge Kirk's yeah. Day. <laughs> out for revenge yeah and then you've got like Discovery is all based around space tardigrades the new Star Trek where it's all like space tardigrade DNA it's just like it's like okay we've made communicator badges with cell phones what's next on the list Joe what do you got 
Uh, space tardigrades. Okay, load them up. Just, just <laughs> call Israel. They'll do this for us. They owe us. Somehow, uh, apropos of nothing, just my mind leaps to uh, back to the early 90s and, and I'm pitching a mad uh, TV sketch, which is like a grunge uh, Star Trek with Captain Kirk, <laughs> Captain Kirk Cobain. And, uh, and, and the comedy <laughs> proceeds from there. Oh, yeah. oh, oh man, I love that. Well, Instead of tribbles, you have, you have foos. <laughs> and they're, they're, they're foo fighters, you see? you see. You can just go all day. You can go all it day. It just writes itself. Well, throw this next story. Of, throw in a couple of Asian, uh, racist Asian voices, and you have a perfect mad TV <laughs> skit from the early 90s. Well, this next story has a special place in my heart, which I think you'll understand once you see it. I voted leave, but now I've got 10,000 sex arses stuck at Calais. So this gentleman is um, a, uh, a merchant of um, adult toys um, and uh, he, he voted leave for Brexit, um, probably because of racism, um, but he didn't really think it through because now he's having a lot of trouble importing his uh, sex arses. <laughs> <laughs> and I just love this picture, um, the juxtaposition of the arse in question and the, the, the gentleman's face. Um, so um, let's again throw this to our panel. What do you guys think? Like, is this poetic justice? Has he been hoisted on his own sex arse? Or, um, or what do you have to say about it? Well, I mean, I would say that definitely, you know, there is, I mean, it's, a, it's an economics uh, issue, regardless of the, yeah. of the product itself. It all, it all goes back to economics and, mm -hmm. and Marx, of course. And so I would say that, you know, it's a supply and demand thing. He can only fuck so many sex arses a day and 10,000 <laughs> would, seem, would seem too much, right? So he has clearly too much. There is a surplus value of passages, anal passages, versus his one penis, right? And mm -hmm. so this is, and I'm making a presumption, perhaps both a binary and a non-kink positive one, that it is his penis he's inserting into these uh, silicone uh, rectal cavities. Um, <laughs> I just realized that is a rather... Um, Bit presumptuous, problematic, Lara. Presumptuous yeah. of me, and I would like to apologize to the man uh, for for Who knows what he wants perhaps, to use them for. Perhaps but... debasing him and impacting on his dignity by making these <laughs> presumptions about how many sex asses he fucks in a day, or indeed if he fucks them, because many drug many drug dealers do not use their products, and True. conversely, he may indeed um, not fuck a plastic sex asses, and they may indeed just have a you know, a propensity for organic acids. Matthew, what would you do with all, uh, with 10,000 10, sex, sex all in one place? <laughs> sex arses, please use the right sex terminology. Arses. Okay, sex, sex arses. arses, yeah. Uh, I mean, that would be the most awesome fort one could build, build just like an, a, like a fort of arses, you know? And, I mean, and, you know, it's the land of castles, Britain, you know? So just build a, an arse castle, you know? <laughs> It, it, that's the one of the things that amazes me about Brexit. They didn't really think it. Through. Lara's like, thinking about economics and being politically correct, and you're building a castle out. Sex of arse castle. I have my priority. Like, can you imagine like the live action role playing you could do in Earth's Castle? Like, Lara, that would that just be appropriate brilliant. use. Do you, do you approve of this use of, of sex arses? A castle. <laughs> it, I think a castle. Yes, any kind of. Uh, yes, any kind of. Well. You know, I would I would want to go for something phallic just for the irony of it. So like mm -hmm. a, an arse needle. Tower. I mean, and if you wanted to like share the wealth, you could do like a Hadrian's arse wall. Yes, there you go. You know, when when Scotland decides to leave, okay, let's just like line them up and cut Scotland Keep off from the rest of Britain. Well, moving from from keep moving around uh, the European Union, we have today some news from France. We used to do news from Finland, but it's a new season, so we're changing things up. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> so over in France, um, pond frogs must go, French judge rules after neighbors complain the amphibians are noisy when they mate. So frogs fuck too loud. Um, these people have had an ongoing saga with your neighbors. You think your neighbors are petty. These people have been dealing with their neighbor complaining about the frogs fucking in their pond for literally like six years. So... <laughs> <laughs> my, first, the neighbors have a point. my first comment would be personal which is they clearly don't live next door to my neighbors because whatever <laughs> frogs are doing is nothing compared to what these two are up to and uh on an, on an, any given night of the week 
you don't know. Maybe the frogs are fucking loud because they're on cocaine. Like, <laughs> there could be... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we need they need to do frog. something with all those sex arses in order to keep the frogs yeah. quiet but <laughs> my um, my mom my mom had a little pond in her backyard and the frogs would come from like there's a there was a natural pond about 15 minute walk away and the frogs would just come into her backyard to just bang all night they just they just move there. They bang in her backyard and then they take off. They they lay their spawn. So there's all these little tadpoles in the little artificial pond and then just go back. And, and it's like I can attest, frog fucking is loud. They they when when okay. frogs get it on, it is like Donkey Kong. It is just can so you, noisy. And I would say you know the sound. What does it sound like? I don't think I've ever heard a frog in a throat version. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah, it's just like a ribbity noise, just like a squealy ribbity noise. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so the official position of this panel is uh, anti-frog. Excellent. Yeah, you know, yeah. And, I mean, to, and to be serious about it for one second, um, I mean, it would really be reliant on what the kind of decibel level of it is, and <laughs> if it's actually uh, causing any um, damage to the ear, right? Because otherwise, I worked, let me just tell you now, uh, they take your picture with Michael Jackson photo booth. Um, and the reason I'm not in jail uh, right now for running that operation is uh, Michael Jackson was not real. It was a cardboard cutout of Michael Jackson at the CNE that kids put their arm around and then we took a Polaroid of them for $10. And so one of the things that happened there was they played Michael Jackson mu music on a slow play VHS tape for the entire shift of eight and a half hours a day. Oh, and so by the end of the second day, you think that you're gonna take your own life just because of, you know, it's it's so repetitive and irritating. Uh, but the reality is that after two weeks, you don't hear it. And so the idea that these people would not be able to kind of cancel out that kind of noise, to me would only be relevant if it was, as I said, such at such a decibel level that it was causing uh, your trouble or your inability to kind of, um, you know, have a conversation or enjoy television and so on. Otherwise, uh, we're very good at tuning out uh, noises, especially yeah. if they're consistent uh, over time, right? It's one of the ways we survive in the city. Well, or, there you have it. So from news from France to news from Quebec. Here I guess Quebec, the French, I guess the French just don't like frogs. <laughs> I guess they don't. Well, I don't know. Anyway, um, so here in Quebec, we have a curfew right now. You cannot go out after 8 p.m. except for very limited um uh reasons and one of those reasons is you can walk your dog so this couple tried to get around this regular this rule uh by uh the wife put the husband on the leash and she walked him around and when stopped claimed she was walking her dog this didn't work they got fined so what do you guys think do husbands count as dogs maybe they're just I'm really dead. big <laughs> stooges fans you know like they really take i want to be your dog very seriously mm -hmm. oh and, my god <laughs> i'm also it's a it's interesting that they had the uh, they had the good sense not to reverse the genders, mm -hmm. which would have made it a far more provocative news story. You know, if the if the wife was on uh, one on the leash because it, it mm -hmm. creates in her mind so many other kind of pictures, right? Well, um, the real reason they got a fine was because they said dog and not chien. <laughs> yes, it's a language it's language law. <laughs> it was a language <laughs> issue. <laughs> yeah. Sorry to burst your bubble. This is actually a story from the French language media that broke there first. It, they were in Sherbrooke. They were francophones. Doesn't fly either. <laughs> we're being literalists today. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> what is he going to do with all those sex arses? No, they like, really were uh, speaking French. <laughs> to, be, to, be, to be fair, this the, if this was going to happen anywhere, Quebec really just makes sense. Yeah. You know, it, it just does. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting. For, it's interesting from a, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for from a um, you know a civil dis, dis, from a civil disobedience standpoint, right? Because obviously, the easiest thing you do is just say uh, fuck the rules or I'll roll the dice on the rules, you know, and I'll go out for a walk and just hope no cops happen by, right? Mm -hmm. But the idea of 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 concocting something that's meant to be an exception to the rule, but is so patently absurd. It just seems uh, just seems risible to me, you know. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean I'm, I'm, like walk your walk a rat, you know, catch a catch a rat and walk the rat, you know what I mean? It's just like it's 
It just doesn't make any sense. The police like, officer like, starts like, saying to this woman, Madame, your husband is not a dog. And the woman's like, no, you don't know what he's like in bed. <laughs> we have 10,000 <laughs> sex stars. <laughs> <laughs> See, for, for me, li- li- living in Toronto, I have to say, like, personally, I'm like, kudos to them because they put in some effort. Like here, you just have like randos walking around without masks and like, I'm just going to open my, my barbecue shop. Like, right. it's just, yeah. But I mean, they put in some creative effort. They're like, okay, we're going to get a leash. We're going to get a well, collar. Maybe they What's had it already. Dog name? Yeah. <laughs> and, to be, and, to be, and to be fair, the uh, le, le homme chien should not have bitten uh, the police officer. That was uh, <laughs> too much veracity. Too much veracity. <laughs> they, they were just too method. Too method. Too method. We have one well, more. Well, we always like. Or even we better. Do. We, even better we would be the. Even better would be the huge steaming dump while they're writing. <laughs> oh God! Right? Uh, it's too cold for that. Stop, I mean, stop, he stop. don't. He can't help himself. He's a so, dog. He has to go. As long as she picks up after him. <laughs> Ew. Okay, oh. moving on. We always love to end on a happy note. So we thought we'd end with this. Oops, that's gone somewhere weird. There we go. Um, This beautiful picture of Dr. Fauci, who looks like he's been to the spa and had 10 years taken off his life since the beginning of the Biden administration. He just, I just picked this basically because he looks like he's just beaming. He looks so happy. So, um, and not, and again, like we were talking about in me and Adam's banter earlier on in the show, you know, Joe Biden doesn't have to be the best, but there is something to be said for basic competence in government. So on that note, let's talk about that. Let's get our Fauci on. Uh... Yeah. Well, I mean, he's just, I, I, I can't imagine the re- like relief of just being able to go into work and not realize, okay, do I have to talk about to convince my boss to not drink bleach today yeah. like just just the emotional like release of, of that or, or is is my boss gonna i don't know try to like have me impugned before my entire profession because he wants me to to shine sunlight on his lungs you know so crazy so crazy like i, I i'm like surprised he didn't do like a little dance like the first time like, he was up on stage Oh, he did. He's just really short, so it was behind the podium. <laughs> <laughs> Lara, any 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 final thoughts on on Dr. Fauci's new new beaming outlook on life? I mean, I'm happy. I'm happy that he ha- he no longer has to be um, uh, ridiculed by uh, you know a, by a buffoon. Uh, that he and his family no longer are under the threat from people that um, are very unpredictable and violent. And I think it is utterly and completely disgraceful. Um, as for, you know, one of the things I struggle with, you know, in terms of this type of thing, and, and we often put ourselves in somebody's shoes, is, is it more um, morally uh, upright uh, to, leave, to leave the job, right? Um, or do you think I'm going to stay because I can have some impact and, and, and so on, you know? Um, uh, but I, I don't think in this particular case, I have enough information uh, to really make any kind of determination about Dr. Fitch's behavior. But I, I would say that, yes, absolutely. It is ex- extremely nice to see people being redeemed um, who did nothing wrong except behave in the way that they were trained uh, to do. And to me, more than anything, it is a return to some kind of base intellectual norm- normalcy and I think that we can celebrate that, even if we understand that, yes, Biden's a neoliberal shell, that what he did to Anita Hill was utterly disgraceful, that his own behavior is problematic, and so on, and so on, and so on, that things like this give an example of a return to, and this may be the right word, to just civility in a way that allows conversations to take place that are productive, right? Out, there you have it, everyone. Ideological lines, you know. Lara, Lara Ray, thank you so much. Matthew Ardell, thank you so much for taking part in this is a mm-hmm. new segment. Um, and this is a talk show. We we're so happy to have you both on. Um, Lara Ray, you have several books published. Where can people find those one more time? Um, I would, you know, you, we all should support our local uh, bookshops, you know, and so you can, uh, you can do that. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook and I will, um, 
I will order and sell you a copy uh, that includes a donation to Theatre Projects Manitoba, which is the um, beautiful theatre company that commissioned the show. And so, and I always love to hear from people on my Facebook is quite an open platform. So please uh, feel free to friend me and I'll guide you. I'll send you a link to a bookshop, independent bookshop near you where you can purchase a book. And I would love that very much if you, uh, if you Fantastic. don't do it. The other one is out of print, but I'm, I'm looking at the possibility of maybe restoring it to print, even though a lot of the poems are kind of anachronistic. They're just, they're kind of nostalgic and funny to look back on, you know. And Matthew Ardill, um, once again, where can people find your um, your podcasts? Uh, pretty much wherever podcasts can be found, Spotify, Apple, Google. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter uh, at Common Person. Uh, I post everything there. So, so and, uh, and you can also, uh, the occasional joke and me complaining at retailers about screwing up orders to my house. So, Fantastic. And they're looking for a comedy album book club. Um, and what was the other project yeah. you were pitching with us today? Uh, Love is Everywhere. Love is Everywhere and the comedy right. album book club, wherever fine podcasts are found. And we're going to be That's back. That's we- lie if you guys don't know. You're such suckers. You think, <laughs> man, think. Love Intuitive is everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> lie, lie. <laughs> He's tricking you. He's Intuitive. tricking you. In two weeks, we're going to be back. And we have some fabulous guests. We have um, from the show, Josephine, uh, Tamisha Harris, joining us from Florida. We have from Toronto, comedian and storyteller, Ya Atua. And we're so excited to have them. Um, Kristen is going to be singing us out shortly. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Lara Ray. Thank you, Matthew Ardill. This has been a talk show. And we will see you on February 6th, everyone. Thank you for joining us for season two. All right. Okay, everyone, let me just turn on my keyboard again. I get myself ready to sing this last song. So me and Adam talked about this before the show and I wanted actually to start with it, Um, but I thought it was a little too negative. Um, So here we go. Here is my closing song for today. A very famous song, which you probably all know. Gentlemen can watch while I'm scrubbing these floors And I'm scrubbing these floors while you're talking And sometimes you tip me and it makes you feel all swell In this crummy little town, in this crummy old hotel But you don't know to whom you're talking No, you don't know to whom you're talking Then one night there's a scream in the night And you say, what could that have been? And you see me kind of grinning while I'm scrubbing And you say, what she got to grin? Well, I'll tell you There's a ship, the Black Freighter, with a skull on its masthead, will be coming in. You gentlemen can say, hey, finish up them floors, hurry up, you've got to earn your keep here. You throw me your tips and you look at other ships, but I'm clapping all your heads as I'm making up the beds, because no one's going to sleep here anymore. No one's gonna sleep here anymore. Then one night, there's a scream in the night, and you say, who's kicking up that row? And you see me kind of staring out the window, and you say, what's she looking at now? Well, I'll tell you. There's a ship, the Black Freighter, turning round in the harbor. Shooting guns from its bow. You gentlemen can wipe that smile off your face, cause every building here is a flat one. The whole goddamn town will be down to the ground. Only this hotel standing up safe and sound, and you yell, Why did they spare that one? Yes, that's what you're saying. Why did they spare that one? All night through, through the noise and to-do, you'll be thinking, who is it lives up there? And you'll see me stepping out in the morning, looking nice, with a ribbon in my hair. And the ship, the Black Freighter, runs a flag up its masthead, and a cheer rings through the air. By noontime the dock is a swarming with men coming out of that ghostly freighter. They move in the shadows where no one can see, and they're chaining up the people and they're bringing them to me. And they ask me, kill them now or later, asking me, should we kill
kill them now or later. Noon by the clock, and so still by the dock, you can hear a foghorn miles away. And in that quiet of death, I'll say, right now, right now. And as they pile up the bodies, I'll say, <laughs> that'll teach ya. And the ship, the black freighter, disappears out to sea, and on it will be me. Just like I said, everyone, songs of hope and healing. Welcome to this beautiful new world, and we will see you in two weeks. <laughs>